and then there was light. Sometimes you imagine, you think you're, you're left to imagine you're imagining things, but you know, you get accustomed to a certain environment and you know when something's off. But uh, thank you to whoever was able to uh, get the light on. Luke 19, Luke chapter 19. We're continuing in our series in Luke's Gospel. And we come providentially in the Lord's Day just before Independence Day to be reminded of a king. I'll not say any more. <laughs> No republic here. <laughs> Luke chapter 19. And we've gotten as far as verse 27. I want to look from verse 28 through verse 40 with the Lord's help tonight. I trust that the Lord will open up this passage to us. Luke 19, verse 28, let's hear the word of the Lord. When he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. It came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, Because the Lord hath need of him. And they that were sent went their way, and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto them, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. And they brought him to Jesus, and they cast their garments upon the colt, and they sat, set Jesus thereon. And as he went, they spread their clothes in the way, when he was come nigh, even now, at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. May the Lord bless His Word. This is our privilege to hear it and trust that we receive it by faith as the very Word of the living God. Let's pray once again, beloved. Come to this passage and it, we need the Lord's help for sure. Our gracious God, we come before Thee. How thankful that the King has come, and what a difference He has made. We bow before Him, we recognize His kingship, and though we may say those words, we acknowledge there are times where we wrestle against His authority in our lives. Should there be in any one of us resistance to the ultimate sovereignty of Christ, Rest that folly from our hearts, we pray. We beg of Thee, O God. Grant us grace to be laid low at the feet of Jesus. May, our, may the sins we are most attached to be broken by the power of His grace. May the temptations that so easily beset us May they become overthrown by the authority of our King. Give us the right desires. Give us a true posture of servitude and worship. And shut us in tonight with Thyself, O God. And may we hear from Thee. May that be our testimony. You know every heart and every need. Meet those needs we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the charges that you'll find brought against the Lord Jesus by some 
is that when you come to Luke 19 or any of the other accounts of his entrance into Jerusalem, that they are, they tend to suggest that he is now courting the praise or the adulation of the people in a way that he never did before. And some read into that a sense that the Lord Jesus is being carried away by the moment, is being influenced by the frame of the people, and is now doing something that prior in his ministry he never desired to do. That claim is unfounded. The parable that precedes this passage, which we'll not look at again, but you'll see the reasoning for the parable in verse 11 of this chapter. As they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. The parable then helps to underscore the fact that Jesus, far from courting any sense of a present revelation of his kingdom in the physical realm, any idea that he's going to ascend and take a throne in the heart of Jerusalem, that is not the case at all. The disciples desired that. They longed for that. Others around them obviously thought that that may be the case as well. As we said last time, there may even be in the language a misunderstanding of verse 9 and 10 when Jesus says in Zacchaeus' home, this day is salvation come to this house. There may be some hearing parts of that and desiring that to be expanded as a deliverance to the house of Israel. Verse 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost may be interpreted as a recovery of the lost liberties because of the Roman Empire. But the Lord Jesus is not in any way trying to meet the demands of those who desire Him to come and overthrow their enemies in the present time. If you put the various records together, as the Lord Jesus approaches Jerusalem, it would appear that there is a, a crowd of people moving with Him from the area of Bethany, moving toward Jerusalem, as well as a crowd that then meet them on the way to Jerusalem also. This crowd has been greatly influenced. If you were to ask the question, why is a crowd following Jesus from Bethany, a few miles outside Jerusalem, toward the city, the answer to that, at least in part, is found in remembering that quite unusual and significant miracle of the raising of Lazarus. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. Many people were there for that event. Everyone was overwhelmed, and they saw what could not be in any way dismissed as anything but a miracle. He had been dead for four days. Everyone knew it. He's already in the tomb. Everyone's lamenting and mourning. There is the public expression when he says, remove the stone. By this time he stinketh. And yet the Lord Jesus raises him from the dead and it spreads greatly. Of course, his enemies are maddened by it as well. The occasion that we are coming upon, of course, is that of Passover. Thousands have come to Jerusalem. They are entering into the city for this great feast. Proselytes, Jews are assembling they're finding places to stay around the city and within the city. And there's a, a, an increasing sense of excitement of the event as well as the contributing aspects of our Lord's ministry. But when I read these verses in preparation, and I was reading commentaries and looking for answers, I have to say I was repeatedly left dissatisfied when I was asking the question, what really is going on here? Go to John 6, just for a moment. John chapter 6. This will be well known to many of you, but just so that you keep such things in mind, these texts are important for us to remember. After the feeding of the 5,000, in John 6, read from verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And when they say that, they're thinking about the prophecy Moses gave in Deuteronomy 18. He declared that a prophet like unto him would come, speaking, of course, of the Messiah. And so they're beginning to put two and two together. They're beginning to see this. The miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, as familiar as it is, again, was one of those miracles that had a profound influence upon the generation. 
is recorded in every one of the Gospels because of its significance. And thousands were impacted. Thousands were impacted. And so, you see in verse 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. They are perceiving this has to be the promised Messiah. This is the fulfillment of what Moses said or who Moses said should come. And of course, they begin to put two and two together and they arrive at the conclusion that his purpose then, the reason he is here, is to be king here now. Now, that would be motivated by all sorts of reasons. There could be sincere reasons at the heart of that, spiritual reasons. But at the same time, at the same time there could be carnal reasons because having someone who can make bread out of nothing in a time when there was no help in society, when there was no government aid, alleviated the biggest burden that people had in that day, the burden of where do we find food, the need to provide for our families. This king then, they could be motivated to, to put him in office so that he might every day give food, so that they need not worry about material things. But you see how the Lord refuses it. He departs away. And this continually then is his, his ministry, is any idea men had to immediately place him in an office of authority to, to see him as an immediate a kingship right there and right then in the earth was declined by the Lord Jesus. He was not interested in it. And so you come to Luke 19 and you find not only that there is a lack of him moving away from He's not, we don't find him in any way moving away from what men and women are doing in this passage. But in addition to that, he's actually contributing. He is contributing, deliberately contributing to fulfillment of messianic prophecy when he sends the disciples away to find a quote for them. We'll see in just a moment the fulfillment of prophecy there. But when he's doing that, he's actually in some way aiding. He's aiding. So I'm left with this question, why? Why would he do this? This is against everything he did in his ministry. And I know it's not like the critics would say that he's just being carried away by the masses. I know it's not that. As we've said from verse 11 and even right since, we would know that. So why? As I said, I was left disappointed time and time again. But I think... I think J.C. Ryle puts his finger on He doesn't really elaborate much, but it was enough to, sometimes all you need is a seed. <laughs> Just give me the seed of the thought, and it opens up to you an understanding that perhaps you didn't have previously. Why create a spectacle? Why add to the spectacle? Why come into Jerusalem on a cold? Why have the fulfillment of prophecy so evident? Why have all the individuals then singing and, and not stop them and not move away? Why is this all going on? J.C. Ryle says, and I think this is one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, before giving himself up as a sacrifice, he, of course he's referring to Christ, desired to draw the attention of the whole Jewish nation to himself. The Lamb of God was about to be slain. The great sin offering was about to be killed. It was meet that the eyes of all Israel should be fixed upon him. This great thing was not to be done in a corner. That was enough for me. You may agree or not, but before we go to the verses, and we'll make lots of application here, so I want to get the scene in our mind first of all, and the motivation. What I believe the Lord is doing here is he is controlling all the events that lead to his crucifixion. Now, one of the things I think we can conclude from the Gospels is that, well, we know the religious leaders wanted him dead. You can go back as early as John 5 and early portions where you see this desire to see him dead. So, for a long time, they've wanted him dead. And they sought occasion that they might kill him. Various events, various occasions where they sought to lay hands on him and were unable to. 
In all of that, Christ evaded what would seem to them the appropriate occasion to fulfill their desire. With that in mind, it would appear to me, given the rise of Jesus' fame, the last time, the, the, the time they would want to not deal with him is at Passover. The tension of trying to deal with this matter of this prophet, this man who's performing miracles, who's influencing thousands, trying to deal with him and put him to death at a time when more people are in the city and more eyes are upon their actions would seem against, against what the religious leaders would have desired. They would love to have, to use the words of, of Ryle, they would love to have done that in the corner, as it were, to, to hide away, deal with Jesus in a place where no one is aware, where no one can stop them, where no one can question them, just quietly and in their own shadows try to deal with Jesus in some fashion. But Jesus is controlling events where he courts such attention to himself that when finally they are crying out, crucify him, there is no question in the minds of those gathered who it is they want dead. In addition, they've had days to consider all the events and all the things that he has done. Should there be visitors in the city who are trying to understand and interpret the occasion of this man coming in to such a, a, a great praise and celebration into Jerusalem, they would have discovered things about him. They would have heard the news of the blind receiving their sight, of the lepers being cleansed, of the lame being made to walk, and so on and so forth. So that when it comes to the occasion, no one can say, we don't understand what's going on here. By Jesus doing this, by him, as it were, courting it, not for the sake of the disciples, but for the sake of the glory of his work, to draw the eyes of all upon him, sacrificing himself. That's why you have this occasion. It is so that men understand, men see, amidst all the fanfare, they are going to comprehend something of the awfulness of what Israel is about to do. Kill their king. That then is, I think, the best reason or argument that girds all of the actions that we have here. Why Jesus calls for a colt, why he comes in in the fashion that he does, why he doesn't resist the praise, why he doesn't hide away from the songs that surround him, and why he refuses then to silence those when the Pharisees come to him desiring him to rebuke those who are singing his praises. There is a sovereign hand, therefore, upon the death of the Messiah. It occurs in perfect prophetic timing. As I say, Passover is not the time you want to put someone to death. And yet this is God's Passover. And this is the time it is going to take place. And the religious leaders are going to be forced to move in upon him and call for his death at a time that is completely not the time that they would desire. The Lord is in control. As I read this chapter, it seemed like the repetition of the verses, the theme that brings them all together is the kingship of Christ. Now, that would make sense to you. You'll understand that. But I, I want us to see it in a number of ways. There are overlapping expressions of the kingship or the sovereignty of the Lord Jesus Christ in this passage that I want us to hang our thoughts upon as we look at the verses before us. I've titled the message simply, Thy King Cometh. And I use those words because that's what you have in the prophecy of Zechariah. There we are told that Thy King Cometh unto Thee. And that's exactly what we have here in the passage. First, note with me, He is King over all authorities. He is King over all authorities. In verses 28 through 31, as he makes his way to Jerusalem, he sends his disciples to, verse 30, Go into the village over against you, in the which at your entering ye shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man sat. Loose him, and bring him hither. And if any man ask you, why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. Once again, and you may want to turn there, just 
so you see it for yourself. Zechariah 9. I'll read the verses relevant to you, just so you're aware. Zechariah 9, verse 9. You have there these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. So that, that's the prophecy. And we don't have to be in any doubt that that is the prophecy. Matthew's gospel, Matthew 21 verses 4 and 5 records, all this was done. The sending of the disciples to go and get the colt. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt, the foal of an ass. That's what's happening. It's the fulfillment of Zechariah 9, verse 9. And in doing so, I want you to see that the Lord Jesus, as he approaches Jerusalem, the timing of this, again, is, is not in any way to be missed. He is heading towards, he is approaching Jerusalem. And one of the ways Jerusalem is described as, is as the city of the great king. Now, when we do Bible quizzes, sometimes you'll come across the question, who was the first king of Israel? And the answer looked for, of course, is Saul. And yet, if you go and you read 1 Samuel chapter 8, I think we can conclude that far from being the first king of Israel, Saul being the first king of Israel, that the implication of what the Lord says to Samuel is that he is their first king. 1 Samuel 8, verse 7, The Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. What had happened up to this point? The implication is that God was their king. He was reigning over them. And now the people have come to a point where they are rejecting that and they desire a king like the other nations. And the Lord is comforting the prophet saying, it's not you they're rejecting, Samuel. It is me. They don't want me to reign over them. It is the kingship of God they are turning away from. Now, we know that God is the king of his people. He is the king of his people. The prophet Isaiah it makes this clear in a number of his passages. Isaiah 33, verse 22, The Lord is our king. He will save us. Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the king of Israel. So Israel is the true king, or rather God is the true king of Israel. And so what, what, what we see prophetically then is expressions of the fact that God is always, God is always the true king of his people. What David does is he typifies something of the king that they should anticipate. So keeping that in mind and recognizing that what happens in this passage is an expression of the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we are learning is not simply that they are seeing someone who is a king physically, but there actually is undergirding this a sense of his deity as well. Because if they're recognizing him as king, and the scripture expresses plainly that it is the will of God that God is the king of Israel, then there is again implied a sense that this, it is, behold your God. It is the one who has come from heaven to reign over his people. And it is his kingship then that is manifest in these verses. Now, this kingship, of course, is not to be restricted to the future. We're not to look at the Lord Jesus Christ as anticipating something merely future, even, even, if, even if you have the eschatological view that Jesus is coming back to this earth and will begin his reign, a millennial reign in which he ascends to an earthly throne, even if you believe that, you ought not to believe that he ascends to that throne to become king, but rather because he is king, he ascends to that throne. So even if I give allowance for that legitimate view, and I, 
I submit to you that that's one way of looking at the Lord's return. If you look at it that way, don't ever consider that He's coming to become king, but He is coming as king. And that's no different here. In this passage, we have a king. And that's why the Lord Jesus doesn't reject the language of verse 38. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. He is king. Now, what, what I want us to see, well, he is king over all authorities. Because when he sends his disciples to this village, he sends them to take the property of other people. It's not just one person, in fact. You can see that. Verse 33, as they were loosing the colt, the owners, plural, thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? I don't know why there were multiple owners. Maybe it's because the place is so small and there's such poverty, which again makes even more amazing the fact that they are going to relent in the giving of this colt to these disciples. It adds to the miraculous nature of what is happening here. But I have two thoughts here as we think of, of this. First, man's ownership does not supersede Christ's authority. Man's ownership does not supersede Christ's authority. When we think of his kingship and his, the fact that that kingship is over all authorities, you see it right here. The Bible, the Bible allows us to have property. The greatest argument or text of argument for ownership rights comes from the Bible itself. The Eighth Commandment, which says, Thou shalt not steal, undergirds this economic understanding that men have a right to own things. The fact that I can steal from you implies the fact that you can have stuff and it's yours. The Bible does not argue for an economic position where everything belongs to everyone. Far from it. We are stewards and God gives to us possessions, things that we can say are ours, and they legitimately belong to you. But what I want you to see is that man's ownership, legitimate ownership, does not supersede the authority of Christ. I want everyone here to understand that, because we become very tied to the things that we have. We hold on to them as if they belong ultimately to us, we look at our jobs and the things that we have in our homes and that's mine, but is it? What if the Lord says, I'm taking that? You, we look at our children and we consider them ours. In some ways, they're ours. And yet the Lord, He takes them. He has a right to take them. We look at our lives. We look at our health. We, we, we imagine these things belong to us, but dear child of God, get it into your heart. The ownership you have, the stewardship you possess over things does not supersede the authority of Christ. He will lay claim to whatever He pleases without anyone restricting that right He has to take what is His. The easiest way to live your life as a Christian is by loosely holding whatever He gives into your hand whether it be possessions, health, children, jobs, and the careers, whatever it might be. Is that not what people need to understand in terms of the Christian life anyway? What is this biggest struggle that people have with Christianity? They don't have a big struggle with the fact that Jesus died so that they might have eternal life. The biggest struggle they have is surrendering their own lives to Him. If He requires... The surrendering of your life. That's what causes men to hesitate. Luke 14 brings this out. The Lord Jesus did not hide the fact that men have to calculate whether they're prepared to be a disciple. What are they calculating? Are they really in a place where they are ready to surrender everything and say, it is not ultimately mine? Man's ownership does not supersede Christ's authority. He comes, you may own a colt, you may own whatever it is you own, your life, your house, whatever. When the Lord comes to take it, only a fool fights against him. 
But also, Christ's omnipotence does not nullify the importance of means. Christ's omnipotence does not nullify the importance of means. As we think of His kingship over all authorities, we might think, well, He has such a place that why does He even need anything in the first place? Does one who is God have need of anything? And you see what he says in the end of verse 31. If there be a query, if there be a questioning of them taking the colt, they are told to say, the Lord hath need of him. As I looked at that, I thought, doesn't this underline again that the power of Christ, the omnipotence of Christ, does not remove, doesn't nullify his use of means? Who would ever say that God needs a colt? No one would ever dare say that. Who would ever argue that God needs anything or anyone? And yet this passage reveals that He uses means. It's a tremendous argument to motivate you, no matter how low your esteem of yourself is, that He will use you. He will use you. Are you afraid to be used by the Lord? The Lord hath need of him. That's a tremendous missionary text right there. You could take that. Yes, it would be not quite in its context, perhaps, a little bit of a springboard. But you get the idea. Foreign missions is what God's use of means. His sending of men is launching forth of people into various places to preach the gospel is His sovereign use of means. And young person, you should wrestle over the will of God for your life. The Lord does have need of you. The question you're answering in your life is not, does God have a need for me? That question's answered. He has a need for you. There's something He wants you to do. The question is, what? What does He have for me? What am I trying to understand about His will for my life? I'm not trying to determine whether or not God wants me or not. He wants you. He wants all of you. He wants your life. He wants your body. He wants your possessions. He wants everything you can offer to be surrendered and given to Him. Consecration is throughout Scripture. So the question is, what does He want me to do? He uses means. He is sovereign. And He sovereignly uses means. Am I speaking to someone who's been holding back maybe for years from being totally sold out? Is there someone here, despite the messages that are preached, that still you're in a place where you, you, you play games with the Lord? You know, it's, you're a Christian and you know you're saved, but there are areas of your life that are off limits to Christ. Remember one man describing it, trying to illustrate how some Christians live their lives. Maybe I've shared this before. It's like the old-fashioned way in which people used to welcome the minister when he would come to visit. You know, back in the day, and it's still somewhat true in Northern Ireland, the minister would go around and visit, and you would never get, like, he, he's not text, I mean, there wasn't text for most of the history of the church, but there, there was no heads up, no phone call, no text message, no email to say, hey, does this time work? He would just arrive at your door. He would arrive at your door. Now you think of how your, your life is, generally. You know, when the minister arrives at your door at maybe, you know, two o'clock in the afternoon, school books are you know, all over the place and the, 
all sorts of other things. Lunch and the remainder of lunch is all over the kitchen in some place. And that's why they had those who had the means, those who had the means, would always try, instead of having a large open space, we have, we have these, these open plans these days, but back then they would take that space and they would divide it in two. One would be the living room and the other one would be the good room. That's how my grandmother referred to it, the good room. And no one ever went into the good room, ever. The good room was like, you know, you didn't go near that except on very special occasions. And so, if the minister ever came, it would be like, come on in and usher them straight into the good room <laughs> where everything was neat and tidy and didn't have to worry about what he might see or not see. Well, there may be a practicality to that that I'm not going to dismiss. I'm certainly not going to criticize my grandmother for having a good room that she may have made use of at such occasions when people would catch her unawares. But it's not how to live the Christian life. I fear some Christians live their lives that way. They let Christ into this little compartment, this, the good room. The Lord's allowed into this area. Okay, so you can have my Sunday mornings. You can have my tithe. You can have, you know, and there may be a few other things that you, you do for the Lord but he doesn't have all access to your life. There are areas off limits. If you live your life that way, you will live it joyless. It will be joyless. The Lord hath need of him. Not part of him. All of him. Secondly, he's not only king over all authorities, he's king over all events. Verse 32, they that were sent went their way and found even as he had said unto them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owners thereof said unto him, Why loose ye the colt? And they said, The Lord hath need of him. So he sends them, and they find it precisely as he said. Before it happens, he, he says, this, Here's how it will be. And they go and they find it precisely that way. Now you look at that passage and you see that in some way he is understanding all that's going to transpire. He, they, he sends them to this obscure little place. Obscure little place. To find the colt owned by multiple people. All of whom are willing to just surrender it. And I want you to understand that every event is exactly the same. Just because it's not expressed by the Lord Jesus Christ, just because you don't have a book of your life that tells you what's about to take place. You don't get up in the morning and he says, you'll leave your house at such and such a time to go to such and such a place and you'll find there someone who needs the gospel. You'll find a person there who's interested in such, whatever it might be. You don't get, you don't receive each day insight into the day that is to come. But the lack of that information does not change the fact that the Lord is king over all the events that transpire. He governs everything that happens. Now this is important to keep in mind because there are events that happen, there are days Let's say, let's put it this way, there are days to forget in our lives. And yet the Lord is just as in control of those days as any other day. He is sovereign over the event of your life. Everything that transpires, all that happens to you, you know this. You know that. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28. You know that. But this is just betting it in. As I was reading this, again, the sovereignty of the Lord, the kingship of Christ over the events, the events of this world. Why? Why is that person in power? 
Why is this war taking place? Why did that event happen as it did? Is the Lord separate from these things? Is He folding His arms and ignoring what's going on in His world? No, no. Every event, every event is just as much under His sovereign domain as the event you have here. That means when you have those days to forget, you're able, you're able to do exactly what Job did, and fall down and worship. That's what he did, isn't it? He's lost everything, almost everything. He's going to lose his health after that too. But up to that, all his possessions, his children, so on, he's lost it all. And he doesn't fall down before God to inform the Lord about what happened. He doesn't fall down before the Lord to question where he was as if he was absent. He falls down to worship. Why? Because he was there governing those events, limiting what could happen. Oh yes, Satan was at work, but there was a sovereign hand that Satan needed permission from to do what he did. He's king over all events. Thirdly, he's king over all creatures. Verse 35, they brought him to Jesus and cast their garments upon the colt and they set Jesus thereon. Why is this significant? Why does this show his, his kingship over all creatures? Well, because look at verse 30. Find the colt whereon yet never man sat. <laughs> he has not been tamed. There is a distinct possibility that the Lord Jesus Christ is about to be embarrassed as his disciples endeavor to place him upon a colt that has never been sat upon. There may even be, in the mind of the disciples, a sense of nervousness. Being conscious of the fact no one's ever sat upon this colt. These men were not ignorant of agrarian life. They understood the distinct possibility of what might happen here. And yet, you find Christ King over all creatures. Coming to be set upon a colt. All sorts of ideas have been said about why a colt. What's the significance of that? Is that, is that an expression of his of glory or humiliation? I think it's an expression of humiliation. There's humility here in his arrival into Jerusalem on a colt. But the amazing aspect is this colt has not been tamed. It's a simple thought. All the creatures of the world are under his sovereign dominion. Not one is beyond his control. Fourthly, he's king over all disciples. Verse 36 and following. As he went, and as he went, they spread their clothes in the way. When he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples, note that, Luke makes that very plain, began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The praise that happens here is stemming from the disciples. They greatly anticipate him taking the throne and ruling and reigning in some public expression. And the Lord on this occasion doesn't move away from it, as we've noted already. They spread their clothes in the way. That would seem to be an expression of, again, the honor that he is worthy of. Other passages refer to, or other gospels refer to the, the palm 
branches and so on that were laid out. Luke doesn't mention that. One commentator said that that may be to remove any sense of the, um, the desire of, of a military aspect that, that may be understood in the Gentile audience Luke is addressing here. So, he, he removes that lest it be uh, mis misleading. I don't know if that's the case or not. But here he is being honored by them, and they begin to rejoice. How do they rejoice and praise God? They say in verse 38, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. What are they saying? They're singing here, Psalm 18. They're not just saying empty words. It's the Bible that comes to their mind. God's Word fills their hearts. And they begin to express them that which sees something of the King coming. And specifically, again, it's not mentioned here. Hosanna is not used here. It's used in the other Gospels. Hosanna, which means like the idea of salvation is in that word. Again, some argue he doesn't include Hosanna because it would be lost in a Gentile audience. I don't know if that's the case. But, but the point of it is, Psalm 18 is at the forefront of their mind. Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. They're worshiping Him. They're praising Him. They're exalting Him. Peace in heaven. I don't know if this is an allusion to their understanding that the ultimate peace will come in heaven itself. Or their desire is for peace to spread and extend into heaven. But whatever the case, there is this praise. And what you see then is disciples that are worshipping their king. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. They're worshipping their king. Disciples worshipping. Child of God, why is it that you gather here on the Lord's day? Why is it that you should read and pray each day and even sing with your family? Why are these things important? Because one of the chief callings of your life is worship. It's worship. I read it read him in mention of Job as he faces the challenges of his life. What does he do? He worships. There, is, there are few higher callings than to worship. What is it to worship God? It is to come into this presence of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords, and to render to Him the praise that He is due. Now compare that to all of our hobbies and our interests and even our responsibilities in terms of employment and family duties. Compare worshipping God to any of the other things that fill the hours of our day. And yet still you will find a reluctance. People will gather in this fashion as you have gathered here tonight. You come into this place, and at times you know it just as well as I do. Your mind is anywhere but upon what it is that you're doing. You're, you're thinking about what happened. You're conf it's so easy to occur where our mind is anywhere else, and yet you're here to worship. You can get down on your knees to pray, and yet your mind is on anything but what it is that you're doing. You find yourself distracted. And yet this is the calling of disciples. Oh, remember this. Remember this. If you don't know what to do, if you're puzzled by what it is you're facing, if you don't know what it is God's requiring of you at any moment of your life, don't try to figure out the problems. Worship. I believe that so many of our trials and difficulties are solved in a fashion by worship. Not by figuring it out, but by worship. That when we have this issue and we feel the burden of it and the challenge of it, or perhaps it's even something that we must do, but we don't know how to deal with it, instead of sitting down trying to contrive what it is that we do or we should do, just worship and the clarity that God gives to His people as they worship. That's how David got through his life. He understood the importance of in the midst of the trials and the difficulties, to wait upon the Lord, to inquire of the Lord. What's he doing when he inquires of the Lord? He's worshiping. He's not just having some kind of empty conversation in his own head. He's worshiping God in the midst of the challenge of, what do I do here? And in that worship, God gives him the answer. Gives him clarity. Disciples are called to worship. 
It is our highest calling to tell the world who Jesus is. There's coming a time in which he will be rightly praised by us. But let us be well practiced in that work before he comes. Finally, he's king over all creation. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. You know, I, I, I didn't have time. But, but let me just put it in here. Reading verse 39, there's a sense in which the Pharisees are actually they are actually playing into the theme of Christ's kingship, aren't they? They don't have the authority to rebuke the disciples, and they know it. They have no power over them, none. And they know it. The only one who can stop these disciples from praising their king is the king himself. So by going to Christ, they are actually contributing to the theme that I'm saying is bursting forth from every text of this passage. He is the king. And even his enemies know it. But of course, their desire cannot be fulfilled. Rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. All sorts of ways of trying to read into what it is Jesus is saying here. I think, I think it's fairly plain. Is that he has the right to be praised. That it is proper for him to be praised. And should those who are given the task and privilege of praising him be silent, the very creation itself will burst forth because the king must be praised. It is not unusual for the Lord to refer to inanimate objects speaking in certain ways. Abel's blood had something to say, didn't it? Here the Lord is saying again, everything must praise me. Everything must praise me. And should you silence the voices of those who should praise me, there will be other parts of my creation who will step right into their place. Again, there is no higher calling. And it also shows you how the enemies of Christ hate to see him praised. They hate it. So child of God, do not be silent in your praise. Be forthcoming in the honor you give to your king. Go into that world and make it plain that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing. Whistle. Permeate the air with your joy with your love for your God. And should they hate the words that you speak, and should they seek to silence you, you keep on singing where you have a right to sing unto the Lord. In a matter of days, the kingship of Christ will be underlined again and again. We will read, we will learn of that occasion, and it's recorded for us in John 19, verse 15. The time when they're calling for the crucifixion of Christ, they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate is going to respond, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests will answer, 
We have no king but Caesar. That will be one expression of the utter denial in the face of all the evidence. And then there's going to be another one. Pilate's going to have an inscription written over the cross. Usually it was a crime. It was a law that had been broken. It was some information that made men understand why is that man being put to death? It was a testimony. Should any, anyone think they could mess with the Roman Empire and be guilty of the very thing that man's guilty of, if they're caught, they will come to the same end. Crucifixion. But for Pilate, there was this conundrum. What evil hath he done? And so he writes over, King of the Jews. And his enemies again are bothered. No, write that he said he was king of the Jews. What I have written, I have written. And so, emblazoned on Mount Calvary, over the head of the Son of God, it was declared to all who saw him die, king of the Jews. King. Is he your king? What entrance have you given to the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? How do you respond to the idea that He has a right over every area of your life? How do you feel about relinquishing all control over the various aspects of your life? Because that's what the king is looking for. Surrender. Service. Consecrated worship of the king. May the Lord help us all to worship him. Let's bow together in prayer. If you're here this night and you're not in Christ, I urge upon you to consider your ways. You've lived for years without seeking the Lord, committing your life to Christ. You've had your ups, you've had your downs. And you keep on holding back. In a sense, you're saying you will not have this man to reign over you. But I urge upon you to consider the life that you're living and the path you're on. If you have not Christ as King, then you have not Christ as Savior. And if you have not Christ as Savior, you will perish. You will die in your sins. In Christ's name, I beg of you then, cry out to Him. He will save you. He will save you where you are. It doesn't need to be complicated. You don't need to make it more difficult just simply cry out, Lord, save me. And if you need discipleship and counsel, if you need some help, let us know. We'll be glad to open the Word, answer your questions, help with your concerns, and point you to Jesus. Lord, bless your Word. Help each one of us to surrender and to stay in a frame, in a posture of Worship and surrender all of our days. To present our bodies a living sacrifice. To not try and hold back. 
Deliver us from vain arguments. Keep us from unspoken reservations. And grant that every heart here would be gifted and given to the Son of God. May even those who are older, more senior, who once upon a time lived a life all out for Christ, may they be afresh encouraged that the Lord still has need of them. Hear our prayers. Bless our time of fellowship tonight. And even as we look forward to Tuesday, make it profitable to this congregation. May we enjoy the friendship we have in the body of Christ. May we be, not in any boastful way, but in a humble expression, thankful for the liberties we still have in this land. Grant, O oh God, you may maintain them and sustain them, even through our witness. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore.